Um, what did you find most inspirational or interesting in what you heard from one of the other panellists? I find the information on the organ donation um, quite enlightening as sort of a general member of the public and the statistician, so it's not really going to rate and then just thinking about all the sort of statistical models that you can build and still you know, help, help clinicians. Um, a previous project, but only with GPs, not, not that sort of thing. It can be really, really challenging to get their buy in and yeah. to get them to actually use the tools that you know are really good. Yeah. Um, that's I found learning about the carbon footprint of. <laughs> an academic who's involved in this research <laughs> is quite interesting. Everybody's hiring. I think I'm inspired how, how different Exeter is from when I was growing up here. Though. There are just many more, more jobs in, in this sort of area and just for sort of graduate level jobs than there were when I was uh, um, a student and most people went away to university and never came back. Um, so it's, it's changed a lot. And, uh, lucky from that perspective. I'm not, I'm not getting lost by the way. Like, <laughs> money. <laughs> I was amazed to learn that Harvard Law students get taught statistics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think they're shocked too. <laughs> <laughs> or decide what projects you're going to work on at the time? Um. Yeah, um, so a lot of what we do um, comes from um, the people I work with, so we're all sort of from scientific background, science, physics, um, so, and we go to school quite often, so we know sort of what the issues are and what we, we might want to investigate. Um, and then we, I mean, the list is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds long of all the things we could look at. Um, but we prioritise the things that um, mean the most to the students, I would say, so have the biggest impact on them, and then secondarily the teachers and feeding back to the teachers as well. So where did your funding come from? Um, so it sounds a bit whimsical, like I wake up all morning, <laughs> I'd like to know. No, um, we're funded by a private investor who really cares about what we're doing, really passionate about education, um, and wants to make a difference. <coughs> What are the requirements of being a chartered statistician? Um, you uh, have to have been uh, working as a statistician for five years. Um, I don't actually know what the um, academic qualifications are um, because I had a PhD. I I fulfilled them, but I, sus I suspect you don't need a PhD. Um, Tim, could you say a bit? Uh, yeah, more? I think uh, from an academic point of view, it's having a degree um, in a subject with substantial statistical content, but then you need five years of on the job experience and professional development. But when I applied for it, I found that it was it was very straightforward to apply, and I didn't have to do any extra work to do it. I could just look back and look my last five years of working and I found that I fulfilled the requirements so it was just filling in an application form. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to say what you've done over the last five years but I think if you have been working as a statistician for five years it's very straightforward. And then do you have to take exams or? Um, no, it, as long as you have the academic um, requirements and you've got that work experience that you can write down some detail about then that's, um, that's the requirement. So it mentioned that the RFS has a mentor scheme, so people who are working towards chartered statistician can get an experienced mentor who can help them in the whole process of making sure you've got, because it's about not just about being a statistician, but you've got a 
read to what you've learned and things and just do one thing. There's a, there's a few requirements to it, but they do have mentors who can help you sort of fill in gaps that you might have in your experience. But about that, so I did that for my job and it was really useful and it's another contact you can make. Probably the harder part of it is actually um keeping up to date. So there's a revalidation process. I forget how frequently is it, something like every five years you have to maintain a <coughs> portfolio of um, the professional de development. Um, so you, you, you have to keep learning new stuff and you have to report the fact that you've learned it. So is it easier to sort of work in one specific area? Or like you said, you work in a broader field, is it easier to do that? or? Um, so my, my application, uh, my experience was based on um, previous jobs where, and in those jobs I was generally working in quite a, a narrow field. So I, I don't think it's a problem if you're working in a narrow field. I think that as long as you are doing statistics, then you will find that you've done enough to, to qualify for it. Um, for me, it was, well, so I did my um, BSc at Bath, and within that I did a placement year, um, actually where I am at NHSBT, where I'm working now. Um, and it kind of got to the end of that, and um, the NHS put a freeze on recruitment, so it, even though I didn't have a gap job guaranteed, um, I was kind of like, well, I've done my placement year there, I was being a bit hopeful that I'd get a job back if a job did come up, and a job did come out, and they put this freeze on recruitment. <coughs> So when I looked um, for a job in medical statistics, because by then that's what I knew I wanted to go into, um, quite a lot of places did require a master's, so I was very fortunate in that I was, even though I applied late, I did manage to get onto a master's course, um, but that then allowed me to get into the field that I wanted to get into. So. I would, I would agree that um, I've not found any barriers to my career, and that's because I did a master's. I think that doing the, the MS, doing an MSc in statistics opens up um, an awful lot of avenues. <coughs> it makes you very employable. Yeah, well, certainly, yeah, from coming from market research, I'm sort of looking around and I'm thinking, oh, I really should do something better <laughs> than this uh, not terribly highly skilled job in, in market research. And uh, we could see that. I mean, I, I actually, I did, um, I did sort of a day release um, one morning of a week at um, Oxford Brookes University just because I'd, I'd really not done any statistics or probability at all before. I managed to get through two A-levels in maths without doing any statistics. And, um, <laughs> and, a, and a physics degree with it doing hardly any and it's not bad at all. So I did go back to, to qualify myself for the MSc. I did have to um, do, the, do some undergraduate courses in some ways that was quite a daunting step for going, going back to uh, sitting with these mm -hmm. undergraduates. Mm -hmm. I um, thought a barrier um, to getting a job would be sort of a statistics job in the South West. Um, so I'm from Cornwall originally, went to Plymouth University. Uh, but actually that wasn't a barrier, I thought it would be. Um, but you know, coming to events like this you realise actually how much there is going on down here. I'd say the main barrier into a permanent academic job is uh, what's called postdocing. So after you do your PhD, you try and get postdoc positions. They're generally two to three years. And there's, there are plenty of them, but you have to be prepared to move. At the time I was married, it's difficult to move everything to the nearest job, so finding something where you are can, can be a challenge. Um, it wasn't for me, and, and, and it is for some other people, so I think Knowing that you will are available to move around the country or even to the U.S. Um, in order to bridge that gap from PhD to uh, to academic position is kind of the main thing for that job. Yeah, just a quick question: there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Mm -hmm. How are you going to be able to communicate risk to the public? What is your role in that? Because you can work away <coughs> in risk and probability. But the public don't understand risk. So what's your role? I mean, if that could come in sort of 
just a level of professionalism. So um, below chartered statisticians, status, there's graduate statisticians, status. And um, it's sort of a professional requirement, really. And um, all you can do is keep trying um, to open it up to the public and explain the risk. Um, so I, I expect that the organ donation will have this sort of problem to it as all the time <coughs> I did in my previous job. You just have to keep talking to more statisticians, keep getting seminars going, sort of really be proactive in explaining the risk and <coughs> should be using the tools when they um, struggle to rethink what you're doing and rethink how they can use the tools. So I think it's actually a professional responsibility for every statistician um, to try. It's difficult, um, but it's always going to be a challenge throughout any statistician's career. I've, I've often thought this notion that the public can't handle uncertainty and probability, say in weather forecasts, is it's just not true. Um, the, I guess the greatest job is, deals with this a lot, but there are betting shops up and down the country, and the people in them aren't academics. The, everybody, or most people, have this notion of odds and what's more likely or not. And I think sometimes we can, commun we can talk about probabilities and percentages. And if we were to say, well, this is about evens and this is two to one, much more, many, many more people would understand. And, and if you look at the US, they've had probabilistic forecasts for maybe 50 years, and they're all comfortable with them. So I, I, I'm not sure I accept the premise that we can't get them. We just have to communicate in the language that people really speak right now instead of using our own academic language. And always say what the limitations mm -hmm. and assumptions are of the method that you've used. A uh, question for Danny, I suppose, really. Um, I've been up and down the country, round and round, um, lived in Birmingham, went to uni in Sheffield, did a master's down in Southampton, um, worked up in Manchester, and finally now stuck down here in Exeter forevermore. Apparently, in the city, <laughs> the first time I visited, I said, I can't believe this place, why have we come here for the day? Take me home now. And now I live here. Um, all because of the Met Office and my husband's job. Um, <laughs> so, as far as I am concerned now, I'm stuck here. Um, I now have two kids as well, and a husband who works 12 hour shifts, days and nights, for completely anti social hours. I'm about, or in my final year of finishing my PhD, um, and about to be released into the big wide world for what I hope is the final time at the end of the year. Um, could you tell us a little bit? So sort of in a positive way, hopefully, about what jobs there are for people within statistics, within the university, because even working here, it's really difficult to find the other departments that are out there, I guess. Um, I work within the medical school, but you sort of forget that there's things going on over here in Streatham because we're in our little bubble in St. Luke. Yeah, uh, there is a, there is a, we're all in our own little bubbles on the different campuses in some sense, and, and I think exist is a good thing, it's, it's just trying to uh, pop some of those bubbles, or at least push them together. Um, so I guess um, at Exeter, we, had, we advertised for postdocs in statistics uh, two or three months ago, and we, we interviewed um, as recently as that. All of us in the department are constantly applying for funding for postdocs. Um, I've, I've got an application in for a two-year postdoc where the decision is due in April, So, and, and I, I know the other statisticians are the same. There are things in the business school, there are things uh, in engineering in general that require statistical expertise. So there, there are jobs coming out all the time. I think what might be useful is if um, we, we perhaps use Exista to help us advertise that. <coughs> to tell the people like yourself in next six. We have plenty of postdoc positions mm -hmm. uh, coming up all the time. And this is true of g as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think, I mean, we're kind of new on the scene, and I don't think uh, many people know that we're there as well. No, but and I think, like um, yeah. Laura was saying about her job, fine, it's with the NHS, it's there, but actually, unless you know the exact title and the exact job that you want mm -hmm. to be able to do, like I can't even contemplate how I'm going to work three days a week to look after two kids, look for a job, and have it all oh, securely in place. I'm going to come back in January, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, existence is there, 
and if we could do something that I guess made people more aware or even things like this where you get to hear about other people's jobs it was more of that I guess that so I regularly circulate job adverts within our department. So if I get an email address for a mailing list, I can just tack it onto the list of um, recipients and hopefully you can plug into that. A mailing list that I find is really useful is the All Stats. I mentioned it at the end of my talk. Um, that's a great mailing list. So if anyone doesn't know, it's a basically a statistical mailing list for the whole of the UK, but there's things advertised from all over the world. Um, it can be jobs, sometimes people ask questions. But I just find it's a great way to just keep up with what's happening. So even though, yeah, sometimes it pops up and it says job in financial or whatever, and I'm like, okay, just delete that. But then other times, like I found this event on there, um, and it's just a good way to keep up with what's actually happening and jobs that are available and just where jobs are even. Um, so it's, it's a good place to find that. Unfortunately, the website looks horrible. Yeah, the so website does look horrible. Like <laughs> um, yeah, yeah don't be far off, but email please. Especially when you take uh, the level up into being a professional statistician, and this goes back to communicating with people who aren't statisticians, it's very rare that you won't have someone to talk to who hasn't got a mathematics background that you have to explain a statistical concept to, and with all of our jobs, even with the academic uh, ones. So you need to be able to take a step back, think this person hasn't done a mathematics and I need to tell them how to use this statistical tool and let them use it. For me, um, it might be because I'm working in sort of an educational technology research company, um, but just being comfortable with technology, being happy to um, you know, be able to code, learn a language, something like that has really helped me personally. Um, and I think that would apply to lots of other jobs as well. Um, for ATAS sports, generally no, and um, there's very high commercial value in the sort of core stuff that we do. However, we also get involved in events like this, and we run workshops with sort of. Fisher Price will say, and things that are still really interesting um, and get people, students actually doing work, um, sort of give a taste of what we actually do, but we, we can't really publish what we do. Um, in consultancy, uh, we occasionally are um, involved in uh, with academics writing academic papers, and we may be. Um, cited as an author or acknowledged in the paper, um, but if we're doing a project for a commercial organisation, then usually um, the commercial sensitivity would mean that we can't publicise our work. Got one tiny question? Yeah, Laura mentioned placement, so I'm going to be really shameless, and uh, I work with Travis on the Keystep programme here at the university, and one of the things we want to be able to offer our students while they're here is a placement where they can go and spend some time with a company and actually see data analysis and some of the statistical methods they're being taught applied and the practical <coughs> application of them. So I wondered whether the panel would be amenable to me having a chat with them about whether it would be possible for one of our students to come and spend some time with them. Yeah, well, we're about to go for the line reception. Yeah. Yeah. We'll the panel around, so it's a good point to say that. Um, yes, thank you had a good bit of Q&A. I'd just like to thank all the speakers again and also to Select Statistical Services for the coffee and ATAS for the wine cheese. Yeah. Thank you.